Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Mike Douglas, and he's the uh, Harvard CMS, uh, and we're delighted to have the uh, second lecture of uh, Nazim Wara, Senior Research Fellow at the uh, Harvard Medical School Laboratory of Systems Pharmacology, and uh, co supervisor of the Open Bowl 2 project, and uh, will tell us more about the uh, structure of the amazing results that these people are going to give us. Okay, so thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here today for uh, my second lecture on machine learning for uh, protein structure prediction. And uh, in my first lecture, uh, I was uh, giving you sort of an overview of the problem statement, why predicting structure from sequence is important. I highlighted alpha for two remarkable achievements in breakthrough, their impact already on structural biology. And then I explained how sophisticated is the map between structure and sequence, and I finally described the algorithm space by uh, highlighting where is alpha full two sitting in this kind of uh, algorithm space. So today I will mostly focus like on alpha full two and its um, modules and its way of working. So the uh, starting point really is the original intuition by uh, uh, Anfinson, which kind of suggests that all the information needed for folding a protein is encoded in the sequence of amino acids. And as I explained in my first lecture, it became a major challenge in biology uh, for finding a computational pipeline where we take the sequences of amino acids and we output the three-dimensional structure. And now we can achieve very high accurate prediction using alpha fold 2 system. I also kind of described how our map now is much more sophisticated than the original um, uh, Anfinson intuition. So instead of only thinking about maps that take and input the single sequence, we can consider uh, using the MSAs. We can also use summary statistics from those MSAs. But for alpha 4 2, the starting point really is the raw MSA. The second step, we need to pick the corresponding index inductive bias from machine learning. Different networks account for different biases, the convolutional networks, they encode the principle of locality, RNNs are suitable for sequential data, graph neural network are appropriate for reasoning over graphs, but alpha 4 2 will pick the transformer architecture because it has the ability of having dynamic control information between the computational units, and it has the ability of better capturing long-range dependence. So alpha 4 2 would be mostly based on top of the transformer architecture. And geometrically, uh, we have also discussed that there are many ways of thinking about the proton geometry. And among those representations, we will pick the three dimensional representation by having an end to end differential network, as I described in my previous lecture and as I will describe later uh, today. So now, really, the idea that we would like to implement as a sort of inductive bias in uh, alpha 4 2 is the idea of coelumism. And in a nutshell, as we described previously, if we pick an MSA with a sequence alignment and we look at the statistics of those MSAs, the co-evolving residues in particular, we could infer some geometrical information. And the idea is that co-evolving residues here uh, with red tokens are very likely to come close to each other in three-dimensional space. So the statistics of the MSA should allow us to form the proteins. But on the other hand, if we think of the problem from structures to MSAs, we have a constrained problem. We cannot allow any arbitrary mutations across all the columns. Given the structure, this will put a constraint on the allowed mutation. So in a nutshell, the architecture, the end-to-end differentiable architecture that starts with the MSA and output 3D structure will account for this intuition coming from coevolution. So, as I said, the main topic today is alpha 4 2. And what I hope is that by, by the end, you would have a sense about how this architecture is sophisticated and the amount of novelties that were introduced in alpha 4 2. So, this is a sort of cartoon representation of alpha 4 2. And in a nutshell, the idea is that we start with the input sequence. We query genetic databases, we generate those MSAs, and we have what is called the trunk of the architecture, 
which is trying to reason over those MSAs to extract evolutionary information from it from the MSA. And then in the second step, we have a structure module that is taking the information from the MSA and sequences and mapping this information into a geometrical object that is the 3D structure. So this is, of course, a very high level uh, view of alpha for two, and I will try to impact the different modules that are part of alpha for two. But before starting, let me kind of make some comments here. I'm just quoting from Mohammed Al Qureshi, who is really kind of expert in uh, machine learning for protein structure prediction, and this is for his statement following alpha for two. So alpha for two is a work of art. It has numerous conceptual innovation. It's not about compute power or engineering, and it's more intricate tapestry. So really, again, what I hope today is we will start to like deciphering this intricate tapestry. What are those modules that explain that, that uh, kind of explains the fact that alpha 2 is a piece of art? So, okay, so this is my plan for today. I will start by the transformer architecture. Uh, I know we have a mixed audience. Transformers are now sort of basic tools in machine learning, but we might have biologists. So I will tell you a little bit more about what those transformers are, how they work. I will then describe, describe the trunk, which is the evil former, the part that is extracting evolutionary information. I will then tell you how the structure module is mapping evolutionary information into geometric features. Uh, I will uh, describe the impact of alpha 42 mostly on the machine learning side. What type of architectures now we are considering in machine learning based on alpha 42 successes, and maybe a few words about what are the limitations and how we can move forward. And I will say more about those aspects in my third lecture. Okay, so let's start with the transformer architecture. As I said, the key element of alpha 42, the network is the transformer architecture. This is an architecture that is now, I think we can say fairly responsible of much of the advances in machine learning. If you think about GPT, GPT-3, DALI 2, Chat GPT, they are all based in one way or another on the transformer architecture. Again, to stress what I mentioned earlier, transformers allow for a dynamical flow of information between computational units and topics. So how the transformer works really in a nutshell. So imagine we start with an input, you pick your favorite sentence. This is, I hope you recognize from Descartes, Cogito, Ergo Sum. And you want to build some representations on top of those words such that you extract statistical relationship between words in a sentence. And the first idea is that you start with embeddings. That's very standard in machine learning and computer science. You turn words into numbers and vectors that you can add and subtract and you can do all sorts of algebraic sort of uh, operation on the words. In the transformer, the key idea is that we will build abstract objects that we call queries, keys, and values. So we will use some weight matrices and we build those kind of abstract objects. And these are really the central pieces of the transformer. And if you want to have an intuition what those objects are doing, you can think of the queries as an object that is helping you to answer the, the following question. What I'm looking for. So you are sitting, say you are a word, cogito, and you look at other words and you use your queries to say, what are you looking for? The key is they tell you who you are. So if you are a word ergo, the key at ergo tell you what are you as a word. And finally, the values, they tell you what do I have to say? So using the queries, the keys and the value, we can now sort of extract relationships, pairwise relationships between the words and build kind of um, the attention and extract better statistical relationships between those words. And the way how it works mathematically, the queries needs to be compared with the keys exactly to know how much you are attending to another word. So you take the product of the queries with the keys. You want to normalize this using a function that is a softmax. You can think of it just as a distribution. And uh, then you multiply this product with the value and you have your output. So basically you take your queries, you assess them with the keys, and then you multiply with the value. And this is the output of the network. And it turns out that this, somehow straightforward mathematical operation is extremely powerful at capturing relationship and statistical relationship between words in a sentence. So the analogy that we want to have here, again, to remind you in biology, much of the information is encoded into sequences. For protein, the information is encoded into amino acid sequences. 
So if you are a given amino acid with a certain identity at a given position in the string of amino acids, you will use queries, keys, and values to use the same strategy. So you will look at other amino acids in the sequence, and you will ask the following question, what I'm looking for, who am I? And at the end of the day, you would like to extract the most important relationship between the amino acids using this computation and this information, the attention should allow you to fold the proteins because implicitly those queries, keys, and values will allow you to get the information about the geometry. So this is really Transformer in a nutshell. If you want to learn more about Transformer, there are many nice uh, blogs and references out there to get deeper into the Transformer architecture. Quick question. Yeah. In your case of uh, your sentence, which has three words, yeah. and um, it's the output of this whole layer uh, three by three matrix. So you will attend per word. So as I said, in my earlier point, so maybe going here, or or maybe did we say we need the questions at the end? So I'm happy to answer, but uh, what is your it's a basic question? If you yeah. Repeat the... yeah. Okay. So uh, the question was, uh, what is like the final output, right? So uh, the, here, in fact, we will update those nodes, right? So I will be sitting at Cogito. I will use kind of those queries, keys, and values to update the, the features at Cogito and then at Ergo and then at Zoom and so on and so forth. So now let's go back to the evil former, which is again, the part of the alpha for two architecture that is using an attention mechanism similar to what I have just described for extracting meaningful information, evolutionary information that could allow us to um, sort of fold the protein. So again, our starting point is the input sequence. Uh, we now query genomic databases to extract those MSA using bioinformatic pipelines. So uh, uh, kind of computationally now, instead of having a sequence of length L, we will have a matrix of length L with a certain depth. And typically for certain proteins, the amount of rows in the matrix can be thousands, if not more. So now we have a plan. Uh, the idea is to use the transformer to build certain representations uh, over those MSAs. But now the immediate question that we face when we use this strategy is that the transformer architecture works on sequences, despite the fact that we treat words as a bag of words, not respect the structure, but it works on one dimensional strings. Whereas here we have a matrix. So therefore the immediate question, how can we generalize the vanilla transformer such that we reason over matrix-like object instead of strings? The answer is pretty easy. The answer is that we will have a row attention. So we will have an attention that take as tokens only elements in individual rows. And the uh, kind of goal of this row attention is to extract precisely relationships between amino acids that belong to the same protein. And we will do this independently for every sequence. Again, just to remind you in an MSA, every sequence corresponds to a given protein typically expressed in different organisms. So we go row by row across this matrix. But this is not enough. We need to add the column attention, which like attend over the same residues across a column. And the intuition behind this column attention is that it will extract information about evolution. Because when proteins evolve, they may change their residues across a column. So if we attend to those columns, we are in principle extracting the information coming from evolution and from mutation. And the combination of the column attention and the row attention is covering the whole matrix and extracting, in principle, all the pairwise relationship between the elements of the matrix. So that's the starting point. It's a small modification of the vanilla attention. And here, just to connect with literature, similar ideas were already suggested prior to alpha 42. This is Chris Crop attention. Nowadays, it's mostly called the axial attention. So in machine learning, attention was used Say, say for segmentation or for reasoning over images. And when we reason over images, we face somehow the same challenge as MSA. Images, images are two dimensional. They are not one dimensional. So we need to account for the rows and the columns. So we do have now a rather simple strategy of using the attention mechanism to reason over the MSA. One thing I have to add, which is somehow counterintuitive is the following. 
if we do an attention all against all, just to remind you, when you attend, you attend all, all, uh, over all the other tokens, so the computation is n squared. If we attend over the whole matrix, computation, this is very expensive. As I said earlier, typically a protein has hundreds, if not more, of residues, so the number of columns is hundreds, and the number of rows are thousands, so we have a very large object, and again, the um, price you pay for it is n squared, so we cannot do an attention over the whole MSA. So the strategy followed by alpha 2 is to say, instead of attending over the whole object, we will consider crops. We will crop in a sort of almost arbitrary fashion the MSAs, such that we cover the whole MSA. So if you think about it, this might defeat the idea of capturing long-range dependency, because we did say earlier, the power of attention is that we want to capture long-range dependencies, and you may worry that by cropping your proteins, you may not capture long-range dependencies because you are restraining your field from the beginning. It turns out that these techniques work, and we can say more about it later. So during training, you crop your MSAs, but during prediction time, when you make prediction for inference, we don't need to impose cropping. So, okay, now we have a sense about how we extract MSAs, how we reason over MSAs using the attention. So we could imagine that we have already a solution for our problem. How do we map evolutionary information into geometrical problem? So you can imagine one solution saying, we are reasoning over MSA. We extracted rich features by feeding this operation into a deep network. You can do this uh, operation multiple times. In alpha 42, we do this 48 times, 48 blocks. So this is very expensive. And you can imagine a scenario where you pick this information, you map it into a two-dimensional representation of geometry, like a distogram. I explained earlier what the distogram is. It's the probability distribution of having two points close to each other in space, and those points, they characterize the residues, and this object might tell you what is the geometry, what is the fold of your protein. So a variant of this system exists. It is called precisely the MSA transformer, it was tested by the Facebook group, where now they have a very strong expertise in using mostly natural language processing for proteins for prediction. So they have used this column and row attention that I explained, and then they turn those information into a two-dimensional representation, and these are the results. So uh, these are the results of the MSA transformer, and they are comparing their results to the prior state-of-the-art systems using image-to-image -image map in machine learning. And again, the metric here roughly characterizes how good are the contact maps, the higher the better. As you know, in machine learning, typically bold means like state of the art. And what you notice is that the MSA transformer architecture is doing better than PR Rosetta, which was the previous again state of the art using machine learning for protein structure prediction. But then if you look at those numbers, the improvement is not that substantial and it doesn't really explain the extent to which alpha 42 is a breakthrough. Therefore, the question that we are left with, using the MSA as a row input, using an attention over the MSA with an MSA transformer by itself is not enough to explain the successes of alpha 42. So therefore the question we should ask, why is it the case that attention is not enough to provide highly accurate systems, despite what I said earlier, that the attention is the correct inductive bias for reasoning over protein sequence. Uh, maybe you can think of the following. I mentioned earlier that the right representation for proteins are not images or two-dimensional objects. The right representation is using three-dimensional structures. And this is the idea of encoding end-to-end -end differentiability. Um, if we predict two-dimensional images, the system is not end-to-end -end in the sense where the 3D structure is missing from the pipeline and the weights of the network are not optimized vis-a-vis -vis the 3D structure. So now there is a general principle in machine learning, but also in protein biology, that a powerful architecture needs to be end-to-end -end differentiable. And that was really prompted first by, again, Mohamed al Qureshi in a very important kind of conceptual paper with the title End-to-End -end Differentiable Learning of Protein Structure, suggesting strongly that the right bias in machine learning is to predict structure instead of images. So then for our problem, you might say, we can improve the MSA transformer by predicting 3D structures in an end-to-end -end fashion instead of predicting images. As we will see, this is part of the problem. 
but it's not the only issue explaining why MSA transformers are not powerful. And the reason is about graphs. Again, to remind you here, what we are trying to extract from the MSA, we are trying to extract a graph-like structure. Again, I'm using the word here, graph in a loose sense, not in a sort of strict mathematical sense. So we are trying to learn a graph that is encoding the geometry of the protein. So implicitly in this network, there is a graph-like structure that is learned by the network. And here, if we turn to a more specific case of a graph that is describing a chemical molecule, it has been earlier, it has been noticed independently of protein biology that the transformers are not the right inductive bias for reasoning over a graph. So if you pick this type of architecture, a transformer or recurrent network, and you reason over a graph, typically you don't achieve high performance. And the reason in a nutshell is the following. I told you earlier, briefly, what are the queries, the keys, and the values. In fact, those features are extracted from the nodes. So if you think about a sentence, the words of the sentence are nodes. And so we are updating information coming from the node. If you extend this picture, the nodes of the graph are the atoms. So we will do a sort of calculation that is computing the attention again by multiply, sorry, multiply, multiplying the queries with the keys and so on and so forth. But in the whole pipeline, the transformer is not explicitly seeing the edges. But we do know for chemical kind of compounds, edges are very important. Also from a high level level, from a high level perspective, we do know that in physics, the relationship between the atoms are encoded into edges or pairwise representation, which are missing from the transformer. So to summarize this part, transformers, at least the vanilla transformers, are not the right inductive bias to reason over graphs because they don't have the ability to build representations, at least explicitly, over the edges. They are sort of node centered. So there were proposals then in the literature to kind of extend the attention mechanism such that we allow the attention to now have an edge awareness and reason directly over edges. So this is one proposal. The idea is that if you have a graph, you will extract some features from the edges on top of the nodes. You build certain encoding for those edges, an edge encoding, a spatial encoding, and then you will add those features as an extra term to compute the attention. And the idea is that by doing such operation, you build now an attention pipeline that has the ability to reason over edges and it has this edge awareness. So mathematically, it's quite simple. I told you earlier that the key operation in attention is computing or comparing queries with keys. So now we add the bias term that is pairwise, ij. And this bias term is precisely encoding the pairwise relationship and the edges between the graph. So we might think that now we have a strategy for alpha four two. If we assume that the MSA is trying to build representations over the graph and the graph is an implicit object that we have to learn, we may think that adding a bias term can improve the performance of the MSA transformer that is lacking this awareness. So we go back to our pipeline. Again, as we said, we start with the sequence, we generate the MSA, we update the MSA. So now the question that we are facing, how can we add a bias term to the MSA? This is a subtle question because unlike my example for chemical molecules, at the beginning of training, we don't have a graph to start with. That's what we want to learn. That's the object that you want to output, so we don't have it. The strategy followed by alpha 2 is the following, is that on top of genomic data search, we can have a structured data search starting from the um, initial sequence. So there are bioinformatic pipelines that allow you to pick your favorite sequence, query structural database, and find candidate structural homologs, so structures that might look like your original structure. So we use those bioinformatic pipelines. From those um, templates, we can generate pairwise representations that correspond to those templates. So those templates, they are likely to correspond to the structure of your original structure. And then we will use those templates as pairwise representations that will allow us now to build features that capture pairwise relationship. And we will use those pairwise relationship now as a edge or bias term to add to the MSA calculation. So by following this pipeline, 
we start with the usual attention by exchanging or computing the product of the queries and the keys. And now we will add a bias term that is coming from those uh, templates or updated representation. And what is important here is that we add this object only to the rows, not to the columns for a very simple reason. Each row in the MSA corresponds to a sequence of a protein. Each protein is including a graph. Therefore, we add the bias term to the row attention. The column is accounting for the variation of the mutations along evolution. It doesn't correspond to a graph. Therefore, we keep the column as is using the valina attention without adding a bias term. So now we have a sort of idea. How can we start with the naive MSA transformer and make it better at building representations over the edges of the graph? So now that's the situation that we have. Unless, unlike, sorry, the sort of naive MSA transformer, we have a more we have a more sophisticated pipeline that accounts for this edge awareness and allow the system to build better representation. So this is like a starting point to think about the evil former part of alpha 2 and how it is different from the naive MSA transformer. So given this picture, we could say, now we have all the tools to move to the next step, which is using this information and fold the protein in the structure model. So that could be one scenario. We have added our bias term, we update our MSAs, and then we turn the MSAs into uh, a structure. It turns out that this is not enough. We can do something more sophisticated. And we can think of it in the following way. The edge term that we are adding at the beginning might not be the right one. It's not coming from the correct sort of protein. It's coming from something similar. Or I have also have to say, there are situations where we don't have structural homology. So there are many situations in biology where when we do this query, when we follow this arrow, we don't have a template to start with. So there are many situations where the starting point here, the initial condition is an empty object. So to tackle this question, the fact that we may not have an initial condition as a template, we may not start with sort of the right representation. The idea is that now we will say, we will take those pair representation and update them into the network such that now we will build better and better edge representations that correspond to the uh, original uh, um, uh, sequence that we started with. And we will allow a flow of communication between the two-dimensional representation of the uh, pair representation and the MS. And we will do it multiple times in a dynamical fashion. We will do it 48 times. So this is a very deep and expensive um, network. So this is uh, the kind of idea of alpha 4 2. But I want you just to reflect um, a moment how radical is that this idea. So this is extremely novel. I don't think such ideas have ever been tested, at least in molecular biology previously. So to understand how this idea is radical is that typically those pair representations are the input of our network. As I explained earlier in the MSA transformer, you expect to see those objects at the end of your training. You include your MSAs, and then you output those two dimensional representations. Here, as if we are taking an output object, we use it as an input, and during training, we make it better and better and better. And then you can ask the question, what is the purpose of this move? Why we will take an output and use it almost as an input? The idea is that we think that the MSAs, they contain geometrical information. So by looking at coevolution and the pairwise relationship between different tokens in the MSA, we will have a geometrical relationship. But the fact that we have this dynamical sort of update, we allow or we facilitate the MSA to extract geometric information from the beginning. So the pair representation track, you can think of it as a sort of placeholder, which might be almost empty at the beginning, and it will get better and better by building better representations during the different blocks. And I think this is extremely novel as an idea. So we could say now we have all the ingredients of the evil former to kind of turn to the structure module fold our proteins and uh, kind of assess the performance of our system. Again, it turns out that this is not enough. We can do even more than that. Here in the communication channel, we have a flow of information 
from the entire presentation to the MSN. So each time we update the edge information, we improve the kind of relationship between the edges and the MSA using the flow that I mentioned earlier, which is adding a bias term to the row attention. We can do something more sophisticated by imagining another flow of information that goes from the MSA to the pair representation. Again, to remind you, in the co-evolutionary intuition, the idea is that the MSAs and their statistics contain an information about the pairs, about the geometry and the contact map. So let's take the output of the MSA track and let's use this information to build better two-dimensional representation. So we see that there is this kind of very sophisticated communication in the evil former between what you may call the one-dimensional track. So despite the fact that we have a matrix here, but each row corresponds to a protein. So this is, uh, you can think of it as a one-dimensional track. This is two-dimensional. So we have this kind of very sophisticated communication between 1D and 2D representation. It is very dynamical. It happens at every block. So now the next question is, how can we imagine a communication between the MSAs and the one-dimensional representation and the two-dimensional representation? So I explained earlier, the information flow from 2D to 1D is adding a bias term in the row attention. So how we gonna use the MSA information to update the pair representation? So the idea is that you, you pick two columns in the MSA, I and J, and you will uh, use a sort of operation that take I and J, you will build the pair, I, J, and this pair will update the corresponding entry in the matrix. Just to remind you, we are using those indexes I and J, they go over the, the sequence. If the sequence is of length L, this object is of length L squared, so if we pick an I and a J here, we will have the corresponding entry matrix in the um, two-dimensional representation. Uh, in a nutshell, how this is done, you uh, pick a column at index I, residue I, you pick a column at a residue J, you do an outer product, take a mean, and you use this object to update the corresponding entry in uh, the matrix. This is obviously very expensive as a computation. So now what I really want to highlight is that we started with this intuition. We did say there are some statistics to extract from the MSAs. It will allow us to have an inference problem for the geometry, and we have a constraint problem from the geometry to the MSA. And this communication flow in the evil former, in a way, is capturing in a sort of quantitative way the intuition that we started with. We have a communication from the 2D representation to the MSA and from the MSA to the 2D representation that are kind of trying to account for the intuition that we have from coevolution. So, and overall, the uh, kind of pipeline that we have in the evil former is really reflecting this intuition, unlike the naive MSA transformer that we started with. So this is our situation now. We do have this very deep sort of trunk that we call the evil former. We have 48 blocks that updates the uh, MSA, the uh, pair representation with a very subtle and sophisticated communication channel. And we could now again say, uh, we are done with the evil former. We can move to the 3D structure and think about the geometry and how we form the protein. It turns out that this is not enough. And to remind you, um, my first lecture, the update of those pair representations is quite challenging. So from a high level perspective, you can think of this update as an image to image map. And typically in machine learning, when we do image to image maps, certainly over geometry features, those maps are inconsistent in the mathematical sense. And then now I will describe what is the inconsistency and what is the solution that is provided by alpha 42 to tackle this inconsistency. So imagine that our map now is explicitly about the pairwise distances between all the residues in the protein. So every element in this matrix, ij, ik, jk, is encoding the distance or probability between two residues. Uh, if this matrix was a bona fide geometrical object, they need those atoms, I, those residues i, j, and k, they need to sit on a triangle, and the triangle needs to fulfill the triangle inequality. That's an obvious statement. Now, if we think of a network, Imagine you have some geometrical representation that you update 
using a network, a convolutional network or an attention mechanism, because those networks, they are not aware about Euclidean geometry, and because they are updating those entries independently, so we will update ij, and then ik, and then jk, what could happen is that the output of this network update might violate the triangular inequality. So if we take a naive two-dimensional track, and we update those pair representation in a naive way, we may end up building representations that are violating basic geometrical relationship, and this might not be a good feature to have in the evil format. Therefore, the question, how can we have a two-dimensional track that is accounting for the triangular inequality? As I hope you imagine immediately, uh, implementing such relationship in machine learning is not trivial. But if you want to be and to end differentiable, if we kind of implement this relationship in a hard way, this is quite complicated. So what AlphaFold 2 is doing is doing something smooth. It's not hard coding the relationship. What it's doing, it is uh, doing the following. So if we want to update an IJ entry in our matrix, instead of just looking at IJ, we will allow the pair IJ to look at all the other Ks in the metric, all the other rows and kind of columns. So we will have an object that is somehow AIK, AJK, and by allowing the network to look at all the triplets instead of the pairs, the network will by itself at some point learn that it needs to build better representation of the triplets and therefore respect the triangular inequality. Again, this operation is very expensive because now it's NQ. We need to look at three index to update the um, pair representation. It has two steps. There is a multiplicative update that allows us to do updating the IJ, and there is an attentional update that I will not get into the details. I think here I'm just giving you sort of the gist of what is that. Now, if you want to ask yourself how critical or how important it is to account for triangular updates and uh, for the triangular inequality, we don't have a direct evidence from alpha for two, but we have an evidence from another paper, omega fold. So omega fold in a nutshell is an alpha for two based architecture to a large extent, which is taking as inputs um, natural language processing embeddings, and it's folding the proteins using those embeddings instead of MSAs. But I'm looking at this plot and what should be of interest to us is the red curve. So the red curve here is roughly characterizing the amount of triangular violation happening in the evil former. And what you see here in the sort of X axis, these are the number of layers uh, in the evil former. I said there are 48 in alpha 42. And what you see at the beginning of training, the network is not really capturing the fact that it needs to enforce the triangular inequality. The violation is high, but while it is trained, and why the pair representations are updated using this kind of uh, triplet attention or triplet update over i, j, and k, the network slowly starts building better representation and the triangular, the triangular inequality violation gets smaller and smaller and smaller, suggesting that this addition of having a sophisticated update for the pair track is also uh, an important element for understanding alpha for two successes. So now we have our evil former. Uh, the evil former, again, contains two tracks, a one-dimensional MSA-based track, a two-dimensional track that is updating those representations in a subtle way, such that we have a smooth condition that is trying to account for the triangular inequality. We do have all those communication, we do it 48 times. Now the question is how we use what we have learned from the evil former to kind of fold our proteins and get the three-dimensional structure? That was a sort of really mysterious question uh, after alpha for 2 presentation at the time. For many practitioners, it was not really obvious how do we move from this uh, 1D and 2D representation into the 3D representation. So one first suggestion was we should take the two-dimensional representation, and this information should allow us to map our information into um, the 3D uh, representation in terms of atomic coordinates. As I hope you immediately realize, this is not completely obvious because the matrix that we are building here, we have a sort of overdetermination. There are more pairwise distances than atoms. So how can we solve this problem? How can we turn this two-dimensional object 
into a consistent three dimensional um, solution. It turns out that alpha fold two is taking two objects for uh, folding the proteins in the structure module. It is taking the two dimensional representation, but is also taking the very first row from the MSA that correspond to the starting sequence. And the intuition behind that is the following. When we look at the starting sequence, we don't have much information, but if you look at it from the kind of machine learning language, we only have one hot encoding. For well, what we have here as information, we have the identity of the amino acid and its position along the sequence. But because we have updated the MSA 48 times, now we have a much richer representation of the top sequence that we are interested in. And this rich in representation might uh, account for much of the information needed to fold the proteins. So in a nutshell, now we pick the top row, we pick the uh, pair representation, and we need to find a map such that we get our structure. So that's our plan. So the structure model. So now I, I cover the evil former. I hope I convey to you again the idea that it is a very sophisticated pipeline. It's not the kind of situation where you will turn to machine learning, you will pick your favorite transformer, feed it to the system, and build some kind of representations and then output your uh, favorite uh, structure. It's way more sophisticated. So now let's turn to the structure model. Now, our task is the following. Given the sequence, which is coming from the top row of the MSA, the output of the MSA, given the output of the pair track, we need to find a map that allow us to predict the structure. How are we going to find the map? So now I will step back just a moment, remind you briefly what we have discussed about protein geometry and how the network would reason over the geometry. So as I said in my earlier kind of lecture, you can think of the protein geometry as being made of a backbone, which is almost a linear polypeptide chain, where the central atom is the C alpha. And then we have a side chain atom uh, or collection of atoms. They, they, they are out of the C alpha. So your C alpha acts like an anchor. And the chemistry of the uh, backbone is very similar. So all religions have the same chemistry along the backbone, whereas the side chain atom constituents varies from one amino acid to the other. And this is what explains the diversity of the amino acid in a protein. As also we have discussed in my previous lecture, the very first step for predicting structure is to predict a robust and accurate backbone. So we will have a sort of two-step approach. We will first predict the backbone, then given the backbone, we will add the side chain atom. So we are left with the backbone. And then the question is, how we should reason geometrically over the backbone to allow the network to build better representation? The choice made by alpha photo is the following. To remind you again, we did say that the bone length and the bone angle along the backbone are fixed. They are rigid to a large extent. It's a very good approximation. So we will assign frames to triplets of atoms. So I move along the backbone. Each time I have a triplet of N, C alpha, and C for a given residue, we assign a triangle. So if we have N residues for a protein, we will have n triangles per protein. And those triangles are rigid. They have the same length, the same angles, because the bone length and the bone angles are fixed. What varies is their absolute position in Euclidean space and their orientation. And that's what we would like to learn. We would like to learn the position and the orientation of those triangles in Euclidean space. And this should be enough to fold the protein or at least the backbone. So, but now first, geometrically, how do we think about those triangles? So imagine we pick a triangle in Euclidean space with respect to a global reference frame. We will first center our attention around C alpha because it's the anchor atom. This is where my side chain is starting. So we will describe the position of the C alpha using a position vector, or, or you can think of it as a translation from the origin to C alpha. Uh, the translation vector is not enough to characterize the orientation of the triangle. We need to add a local reference frame. So for each triangle, we will build a local reference frame. There are many procedures. In alpha for two, we use the Gram-Schmidt process. So this is very easy. We have two vectors, unit vectors that lie along the plane in which the triangle
reminding this extended result by Euler, there, there are unique rotation matrices that map one frame to the other. So to sum up, every triangle in the protein will be described by a pair, a rotation matrix, and a translation vector. And this information is complete to characterize the orientation and the position of the frame. Therefore, our plan from now on is to learn those objects to build the backbone geometry. So let's go back to the backbone and let me now mention a radical decision made by alpha 40. So we have those triangles, but now when we make this decision, we will cut those peptide bonds. So instead of thinking of a protein as a linear polypeptide chain, we will cut the peptide bond and we are left with a residue gap. So there is no more connection between the peptides. So you might think of it as a bag of triangles. This decision obviously is unphysical. Now we need to ask the following question. What was the motivation between this decision? Why do we need to break the bone along the protein? And why we need to reason now over a physical object, a bag or a residue gas of triangles? And here I go back to the kind of language or text case. And to remind you what we have discussed and the difference between RNS and attention. So in, uh, if we take a text, in uh, language, we have a natural ordering of words. You can think of this ordering as accounting for a bond. It's not a physical bond, but it's uh, a bond. And the RNNs, they go over those tokens or words by respecting the bonds because they are sequential. We go from X1 to X2, so on and so forth. What the transformers are doing to build a better dynamical representation between those words and allow the attention to pick the right sort of relationship between those tokens is that it breaks this kind of virtual bonds between the words. It turns those tokens into sort of a bag of words and an order set. And then it allows the network to pick the right relationship using again, the mechanism of queries and keys. And we explain that this is essential for capturing long range dependency, which is also critical for understanding the folding. Because as we said, you can think of the folding as an optimization problem you start with an uh, unfolded polypeptide chain and you need to fold it into space. And to solve this optimization problem, you need to bring tokens that are far away along the string um, into sort of a contact in three dimensional space. And attention turns out to be powerful at capturing those uh, relationships. So, to sum up, we break the bond for the protein precisely because we follow the analogy of words by breaking the bonds between the words. And now we have this gas of triangles and we will let the attention to kind of uh, compute all those pairwise relationships with the aim of capturing the right relationship. So in a way we are de-emphasizing the local kind of peptide bond relationship so that we allow the network to capture long range dependency instead of just focusing in the local sort of context. So that's the reason behind why we relax the bond condition and we have a bag of triangles. Mm -hmm. So next step, unlike the words, triangles live in Euclidean space. So even if we have a gas of residue, they need to be somewhere. Um, and the choice made by alpha 42 is to say at the beginning, such that we de-emphasize any position or any relationship between any two triangles, we will take all the triangles we collapse them at the origin such that the C alpha atom is sitting at the origin of the global reference frame and all the local reference frames are oriented in the same orientation as the global reference frame. And again, the idea here is that you want to put the triangle at equal footing and let the network by itself learn the important relationship between those triangles. This initial condition is called the black hole initial condition by the authors of alpha 4.2. I leave it to you whether this is a good choice for naming this condition. So now this, the aim that we have is to say, given this collapsed initial condition, we need to find a feature map, a network that will start moving those triangles out of the origin and slowly putting the triangles in the right place such that collectively they recapture the polypeptide chain and the backbone zero. Uh, so the plan is the following. As I said earlier, we have the one dimensional sequence and the two dimensional representation coming from the evil former. These are the outputs of the evil former. 
we take this initial condition, we fit them together, and we need to predict the structure. And as a first step, we need to predict the backbone, which in fact boils down to the fact that we need to update those triangles such that the triangles are moving around in Euclidean space and collectively they will form a sort of um, polypeptide chain. So that's the plan. And the question, how we're gonna achieve this plan? And again, what type of kind of mathematical subtleties we will face for achieving this plan? Again, unlike the problem with text where we take a sentence, we cut the bones and we have a bag of words, in geometry and in protein in particular, we face a problem, which is we don't have absolute coordinate systems. I told you the initial condition in alpha 42 is to take all the triangles and collapse them at the origin. But you could have said the choice that we are making is an arbitrary choice. We could kind of apply a rigid transformation, a rigid Euclidean transformation. We can change our coordinate system and we start with a different initial condition. And I hope you immediately realize that the initial condition could not matter. Proteins, they exist in Euclidean space, whether we re rotate or translate our kind of global reference frame, we are talking about the same protein. So we need to have a network that is accounting for this condition. Again, that is uh, sort of beyond what we have seen in uh, language processing, because we don't have objects that exist uh, in Euclidean space. So on the other hand, if we think about the sequence and the pair representation coming from the uh, evil former, we don't need to worry about the SE3 transformation because they are intrinsically invariant. So pair representations, if you think of those as like distances or um, sequences, these are scalars in kind of the geometrical sense. They are invariant by SE3. So we only need to worry about those triangles and their corresponding frames. So going back to our map, as I said, we need to find a map, a feature map that updates the triangle. But we could start with any arbitrary choice by picking a different global reference frame. And we could start with this configuration. We can use the same feature map and we will update those um, kind of frames. But the question that we need to ask, what is the relationship between the updated frames using the original choice and the uh, frames that were updated using the SE3 transformation? It turns out that they need to be connected by the very same transformation, by the very same global transformation that we have picked. So we see here that we have a commutative diagram that might remind you of like equivariance in mathematics. And in fact, here we are implementing an equivariant map. And in a nutshell, it means that we could first take the input features, we could apply an SE3 transformation, and then a feature map, or we could use the feature map first apply the SE3 transformation, we should end up exactly at the same configuration, which in fact enforced the idea that our networks now, they have as a prior or as a bias, they have this awareness about symmetry. They are aware that physics, geometry, for proteins at least, is invariant or equivariant by SE3. I insist this is highly non-obvious in machine learning. I mean, for mathematicians and physicists, we are very familiar with SO3 and translations, so these are kind of standard cases. But imagine that we have picked a convolutional network, like the standard convolutional networks that allow us to reason over images, and we ask the following question. Is it the case that I take an image, I rotate it, and then I feed it into a network, or I follow the second path, I end up getting the same uh, image? The answer is no, and you can play with it. Uh, you can test it yourself. And the reason is very simple to understand. The vanilla convolutional network, they are not equivalent to rotation. They are equivalent to translation. So if you put, take a cat, you move the cat by a translation, you feed it into a convolutional network, you will realize that the network learned this diagram because it was hard coded into the diagram. If you take the same image of a cat, you rotate it, you will see that here you will have a sort of blurred image that is not like connected to uh, this output. So equivalence is a key uh, idea now in machine learning. And if, when we want to reason geometrically over proteins or any other object, we need to account for the symmetry. The networks need to reflect the symmetry of the problem. So now, again, I go back to my map. We have a one-dimensional representation, a two-dimensional representation, three-dimensional initial condition. We want to have an output, but now we need to have an output such that if I rotate, translate the initial condition for the triangles, the 
the outputs needs to be rotated and translated accordingly such that we account for equivalent. So that's a constraint that we need to account for when kind of building the structure model. So now I go back to the attention. I said earlier that the central piece of alpha 2 are those attentional mechanisms, the transformers. And for the MSI, we have already noticed that we need to add an edge term to account for the graph-like structure. The fact that we are trying to learn a graph and there is an implicit graph, and therefore we added this bias term. Now the question is the following. We have this three-dimensional representation. How can we account for local frames and positions such that the attention now is reasoning also directly over features in three-dimensional space? So to remind you for us, a three-dimensional representation is a pair of rotations that take you from the global frame to the local frame, and the translation take you from the origin to the position of the C alpha. And the question, how can we add those features into the attention mechanism? And that's the addition of alpha photo. This is a novel attention. It is called the invariant point attention. It's a geometrically aware attention that allows the network to pick a relationship in the Euclidean space between those triangles. And in a nutshell, the first step is that in the mechanism of queries and keys, we now allow the queries and keys to live in Euclidean space because the exchange of information is happening in Euclidean space. So setting aside their other dimensions, those objects Q and K, they intrinsically live in Euclidean space. So if you apply on them a rotation, they will rotate accordingly. So we will compose those pairs or the T's or like those local information with the queries, we compose the TJ with the keys. We take an L2 norm because again, that's the symmetry. We want the problem to be invariant uh, for the uh, attention. And collectively, now we have an attention that is attending over the one dimensional representation using the vanilla attention. It is attending over the edges using the two dimensional representation. And it is also attending over the three dimensional representation using this extra term in the IPM. So collectively now we have this attention that allow us to reason over those triangles and understand how they are updated. But it turns out that this is not enough because the output of a softmax is a scalar function in the geometrical sense. So we cannot just take this very simple object and update the triangles themselves. So to sum up this part, we have a novel geometrically aware attention that is reasoning over Euclidean space. This is novel, but it by itself is not enough to allow us to update the triangles because it outputs scalars and we need something else to output the triangles. We need vectors and matrices. Uh, here, just a brief kind of uh, indication to the literature. Uh, a similar idea was uh, introduced uh, earlier than alpha 4 2, uh, kind of geometrically aware attention by John Ingraham and uh, uh, his group at uh, MIT, where they assigned frames to uh, residues and then they build an attention that was reasoning over the frames. The details of the implementation of this geometrically aware attention are not the same, but there was a sort of precedent to it. In the literature. So we go back to our problem. We have this now geometrically over attention that is mixing 1D, 2D, and 3D representations. But as I said, it doesn't allow you to update the 3D representation because it's only outputting scalars. So what it does is that it takes the original sequence that is coming from the MSA and it updates the sequence again. So the sequence now is updated by looking at three dimensional structures. But this is not enough. So down the next step, how can we now act on those frames such that we start moving the frames in Euclidean space and build our um, uh, backbone such that we respect the symmetry of the problem, such that we have equivalence. And that's the next step. Uh, so we will take the representation SI that was updated by this geometrically aware attention. And out of it, we will build a function uh, sort of just a projection that we call backbone update, which is itself made of rotations and translations. And the intuition behind is the following. The only way in Euclidean space to move around frames, local frames, by respecting the orientation of space is to act locally on those frames with the rotation and translation. So we project those SI, the uh, one-dimensional representation, 
such that we will build a local rotation and a local translation. And by acting locally, the those transformations, which is again a rigid transform that is acting locally, I again to remind you, the in this is the index of each residue. When we compose it with the initial condition or any step where we are, we update those frames. So you can think of this. This is your configuration at layer L in the network. This is the configuration at L plus one. And you can easily convince yourself that this uh, mathematical relationship is equivalent, is respecting the symmetry that I mentioned earlier. So we have now a sort of two step update. We use the geometrically aware attention to update the sequence, and then we use the sequence to build geometric features, local rigid transformation that we move around our triangles and start putting the triangles in the right position in the Clinton space. Uh, so now we have the back one. We do this step in a sort of re refinement fashion. So in the structural module, we have eight blocks. So we will start by taking the initial condition. We make one update, and then we will impose a loss function per layer. So we don't wait the network to build representations and at the end penalize the network. While the network is learning where to put those triangles or this gas of residue, we will put the penalty per layer. And then we will take the output of layer L and use it as an initial condition for layer L plus one. So we have this iterative process for updating the frames. This is really inspired from a procedure in biophysics that we call refinement. So we do this eight step, and then we generate, uh, in many cases, a backbone that is uh, corresponding to what should be expected, or a backbone that is predicted with high accuracy. What remains now is to add the remaining atoms. As I told you earlier, proteins are made of uh, backbone and side chain. So the question, how do we predict the side chains now that we have a backbone? So the idea here is that we will take the very same SI and we will use a small network to predict now torsion angle. And just to remind you, locally, each residue has like bone angles and bone length that are fixed. We can move from the triangle on the backbone to the atoms on the side chain by using those torsion angles and the fact that the geometry is rigid. So we will predict those torsion angles, and then we will use those torsion angles to build yet other transformations that will allow us to move along the side chains. So collectively, we will now predict the backbone as it, as it was done in the first track in green that I explained. And now combining the torsion angles, we will build, as I said, yet other uh, local transformations, rotation and translation, to move along the side chain and we reconstruct the atoms along the side chain. I have to say that the whole procedure here was a bit mysterious for all practitioners. Um, and let me just turn briefly to Michael Bronfi, that some of you know, he's really kind of leading figure in geometric deep learning. And he has this very nice kind of contribution about um, 2021 geometric and graph machine learning, where he was reflecting about the progress that was achieved and the prospects for the future. And obviously, he was reflecting about alpha quantity. So I quickly quote Michael Bronstein to really highlight why the equivariance and structural module in sort of alpha 42 was surprising. The success of alpha 42 caused many practitioners to reflect and reevaluate some of their assumptions on geometric deep learning. While differential geometry may be fundamental and useful for understanding and phrasing the problem, effective and widely accessible solutions are frequently found without it. So what's the reason for this comment? Why Michael Bronstein and many others were puzzled by the way how symmetry were implemented in the structural module for alpha 42. The reason is that prior to alpha 42, we had a sort of remarkable amount of work trying to implement symmetries into neural networks. And this is one example among many by Taco Cohen and Max Welling uh, at Amsterdam. They are kind of one of the leading group for geometry deep learning. And they even started outlining a theory. So we have a general theory for group convolutional networks that respect symmetries. And in a nutshell, the idea is the following. We would like to build networks over certain spaces that we think of as a sort of quotient space between a group that is acting nicely on this space and the stabilizer H. So if we're interested, for instance, by the sphere S2, you can think of the sphere S2 as the quotient of SO3 by SO2. 
And then you use tools that are very familiar to mathematicians and physicists to build a sort of equivalent network over the sphere. For Euclidean space, we have a very similar approach. We can think of SC3 as SO3, um, uh, SC3 by SO3, sorry, as R3, the Euclidean space. And we have a whole technology here in terms of spherical harmonics and flash Gordon coefficients that allow us to build those equivalent networks. And the puzzling thing is that, or at least at that time, Alpha Fold 2 is not using any of those kind of methodological development. That's what um, uh, Michael Bronstein was um, uh, uh, sharing in his view. So now if we turn to the literature, maybe the closest to Alpha Fold 2 is a very simple, a powerful network that was introduced by, again, Max Swelling Group at Amsterdam called EGNN. Now it's used in many applications, where the idea here, without getting too much into the details, we have some learnable function over the edges and we will use those learnable function to update the coordinates. So X here are like uh, Euclidean coordinates. So we take coordinates of layer L, we update those coordinates of layer L plus one using those very simple function. And this equation, you can also easily convince yourself, it is equivalent. It means if you apply an Euclidean transformation on the right, it should be reflected on the left. So the type of equivalence we are using in alpha 42 sounds quite similar to this. Of course, the details are not important. Sorry, the details are not similar, but that's sort of the relationship. And again, I think it raises the question, what are the situations where we need the technology coming from group theory and differential geometry? And what are the situations where we can imagine much simpler kind of implementation? Okay, so I go back. So this is now our circular module. We have used our representations. We updated uh, our backbone and our side chain. And therefore we have our final structure. So this is the typhoon representation. So this is the final output of the structure. It is end to end because all the steps that I have described, they are within the network. All the parameters of these steps are collectively uh, optimized together. So it is end to end. We have our prediction. The very last step as typically machine learning, we need to assess the quality of our prediction. Therefore, now we can compare the predicted structure with the ground truth or the experimental structure using an appropriate loss function. So, therefore, now the question what is the loss function? What type of loss function we can use to assess the uh, training step of alpha 42? There are existing loss functions. I will mention one very quickly. It's called the DRNST. And the idea is the following Imagine this is your predicted protein, this is your ground truth or experimental protein. You compute all the pairwise distances between protein A and protein B. You have those kind of two dimensional representations. These are like the pairwise distances. And then you take the difference between those two pairwise representations. And out of this, you build sort of loss function. This is a nice function because it is differentiable. It is invariant. It has many nice properties. And then you can compute the score using some normalization. So for instance, here, maybe the difference between ground truth and Prediction is like for Armstrong. Now, if we ask briefly, can we use those kind of metrics to assess the loss of alpha 42? So this is a metric called LDDT, which is roughly telling you how good you are locally. If you train alpha 42 using this type of metric, what you see is that using LDDT, uh, and I apologize if I don't have the y-axis, uh, the most of the proteins are predicted with very high accuracy, suggesting that the system is going very well. But now if we turn to more global metrics like GDT, so GDT is telling you how good you are globally, what you see is that you have a sort of binomial search. Some proteins that were locally predicted well are still predicted very well with the GDT score, but you have this binomial situation. And the immediate question, why we have this discrepancy between a local metric and a global metric? The reason in a nutshell is that the DRMSD metric that I mentioned earlier is not accounting for chirality. So if I take a protein and a chiral protein, they will be the same. So the DRMSD will not distinguish between whether you are predicting the right protein or its chiral counterpart. Whereas the GDT will capture that. And so this binomial distribution is really about situations where instead of predicting the appropriate orientation, we are picking the chiral one because again, DRMSD is not uh, aware about chirality. So one solution, used by alpha for two again, is to use a more sophisticated loss called frame-aligned point 
error loss. And the idea here is that is the following because we are reasoning over triangles, and triangles have this orientational awareness. Instead of just looking at pairwise distances, we can pick the frames, the local frames, and the positions for each kind of triangle. We do it on the prediction side, we do it on the experimental side, and then we can now do this operation. You will take the position of atom J and you project it into the local reference frame of atom I, and you build this pair vector Xij. You do the same operation on the experimental side. And because they contain those orientations here and rotation matrices, those objects have this orientation of the lens. And then you compare the two, roughly now you have this Dij object which is comparing the uh, objects computed from the predicted pipeline and the experimental pipeline. And this uh, kind of object has very nice property. It has like properties that you can expect from a metric, but it also has like this orientation of the lens. So now, again, by using a sophisticated loss, we can predict proteins with high accuracy locally, but we can also capture their global features. The loss function in alpha 42 is more sophisticated. I will give you here kind of a, a brief overview of this loss function. So this is the total loss. It contains many terms. So the first term is this fate. It's like this um, orientation or chirality aware loss. The second term is the fact that we are doing refinement. So when we predict the structures, we penalize the system per block. We don't wait the final prediction. This is called the auxiliary loss. We have a distribution loss, which is over those two dimensional representations. Remind you now the system is very intricate in like how one dimensional, two dimensional, and three dimensional representations are interacting. So we also have a, a loss over the two dimensional representation, this distribution. We have an MSA loss, which is now more akin to natural language processing. So in natural language processing, we use this technique, which is typically masking. We take certain kind of tokens, a sequence, we mask certain tokens in the sequence, and we try to recover those tokens. So here to make the task harder for the network, we will also mask the MSA, and then we will ask the network to recover the mask tokens, and this is uh, the MSA loss, and we have a confidence loss that is telling you how confident you are about your prediction. Um, but in Alpha 42, there are sort of two-step training. There is the first step where we implement this loss. There is a second step where, when we add sort of slightly more physical primes. Remember, um, among many other things, I said that during training, we kind of break the peptide bond. So those protein, those triangles at the beginning are um, freely floating in space. They don't respect the peptide bond and the peptide relationship, among many other things. So what we do in the second step of fine tuning, we will add a loss that will enforce the physical kind of constraint and resolve steric clash. So I hope by now I gave you much of the modules that are implemented in alpha 4 I will add one last one, which is recycling. So instead of making a, like a final prediction going through the networks, what we, we do, what we, what we will add is that we will take the output of the MSA sequence, the pair representation, the 3D structure, and we will put it again as input and we recycle and we do it three times. The intuition here is the following. We, we can build a bigger network. We could say we have 48 blocks. We can multiply this by three instead of being, doing recycling three times. But it turns out that using recycling is more efficient as a procedure than building sort of a larger network. So I hope by now I gave you a sense of like how sophisticated Alpha 42 is as a system, how many novel ideas are in Alpha 42, and how those ideas are important. So now to ask the question. What are the important modules in Alpha 42 that explain its successes? I will turn to ablation studies. So these are typically machine learning. You train a network, and then you take some element of the network, and you see how this is affecting your performance. I will highlight a few. Then maybe I can stop. Yeah. So in a nutshell, again, this is a plot from the original Alpha 42 paper. What you see here, this is the baseline. This is what you get by training alpha 42 baseline using two tests, CAS14 and PDB. We may focus only on one test. Um, and so here we will look at like those ablation. 
I will start with the first one, which is not really ablation, this is self distillation. So the idea is the following we train alpha 42 using PDB entries that exist um, in the PDB that are experimentally available. So we train the network as a first step, and then we use the network to generate in silico data, accounting for sequence diversity, accounting for uh, structural accuracy. And then we will extend the uh, training network, the training data set by adding those in silico features. And what we see is that self distillation, which is this idea of extending the uh, initial training network, is really improving the performance. So each time we move to the right, it means that there is a better performance. So, and I believe that self distillation would and should be applied to many other contexts in biology and beyond. And it should, well, it, if it's done properly, it should improve the performance for networks. So the next step is templates. I did say that at the beginning, we don't have a graph. We need to generate something like a graph. We can turn to structural databases. We generate templates and structural homologs, and we run them into the network. I did say already that it's not very important to have a template. This is more like a placeholder to build better representation. And we see here the results. If you don't use templates, network is not really affected. You really have almost the same results as the um, sort of baselines. Just again, what I said, the role of the two-dimensional track is to build better representation or allow the network to build better representation. So now let's pick the idea of not, not using MSL. You could have used something else like summary statistics. So if you don't use MSL, we see that there is a drop in performance. So MSLs are important in many cases for alpha 4.2. Uh, what will happen if we uh, just use the uh, MSA track? As I said earlier, this is the MSA transformer. So we don't have the two-dimensional track. This is the non-triangle track. And again, you see that there is a substantial kind of um, decrease in performance. If we don't use the IPA, this novel geometrically aware architecture, surprisingly, I mentioned this is accounting for the symmetry of the problem. If we don't use the IPA, we don't see like a substantial decrease. Whereas if we take the IPA and the recycling out, it suggests that there is a substantial decrease, suggesting again, that the individual effect of those elements are nonlinear. We add two, they are not additive. We add here the no IPA with the no recycling. As you see, this is non additive. So I think I will stop for questions. I hope I shared with you the extent to which alpha 42 is extremely sophisticated and like the extent how we take inductive bias where we should account for physical relationship or geometric relationship when we need to relax the relationship to those kind of features. And it's really taking all this collectively that explains the remarkable and astonishing results of alpha form two. As I explained earlier now, in many cases, we can predict proteins with almost experimental accuracy as, a, as it was suggested in the CAS protein experiment. And we have cases where alpha 2 is almost perfectly matching uh, experimental kind of results. So again, this is a very sophisticated architecture. Uh, many novel ideas were introduced. I believe that many of those ideas can be applied certainly beyond protein biology. They can be applied to other molecular systems. And we are already seeing the impact of this architecture on other networks. But I think to have questions, I will stop. I, I want to say more today, but I think I can take questions. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.